Welcome everyone to the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine weekly wellness webinar. I'm just gonna give everyone a few minutes to come into the meeting. And for those of you who are joining us on Facebook, welcome. We're very, very excited today about our guest speaker. I'm going to share my screen here. Andrew, can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Okay, so everyone, um, thanks so much for joining us today on this lovely December 4th. Uh, today, our guest speaker will be speaking on living with neurodegenerative disease, fostering social connection in a time of physical distancing. distancing. And um, Indu Subramanian is an MD, and we're just so thrilled to have her here. So for those of you who are just joining our community for the first time, the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine is a global interprofessional integrative health association working to transform healthcare, body, mind, spirit, community, and planet. And we've been around since the 70s and um, just are really thrilled to have an, such an incredible interprofessional community working towards uh, this transformation. So it is truly a pleasure uh, to have Dr. Indu Subramanian here with us. Uh, Indu has been a speaker at our past conferences and is a just beloved member of our community. She is the director of the Southwest uh, Parkinson Disease Research Education and Clinical Care Center of Excellence in Parkinson's Disease. She's a clinical professor of neurology at UCLA here in California and she established the Movement Disorder Clinic at the West Los Angeles Veterans Administration. So I just would really love everyone to um, welcome her. And today we're gonna just have a really wonderful presentation um, from this incredible doctor. So welcome, Indu. Hi, thank you so much, Tabitha. It's great to see you and welcome everyone out there and happy holiday season and hopefully everyone's staying safe. And, you know, I know it's a, it's weird to be physically distanced like this, but we're socially connecting and that's sort of what I wanted to um, try to instill a little bit in our talk today. And just wanted to thank you and your organization and this platform to, you know, for hosting this. And um, I think it's really a great way to globally connect uh, with so many folks out there that I know are um, having similar issues in their practices and in their lives. And so hopefully I can give you a little bit of um, tips that we've learned um, in our uh, management of neurodegenerative disease. And I also wanted to, um, you know, give a shout out to the organization because I think as you'll see in my, um, my talk that this has been meaningful to me and transformative in terms of some of my approach to my research and uh, clinical care and even my life, honestly, um, as a person, just to take some of the principles that I've learned from the integrative medicine, you know, uh, meetings that I've uh, shared with you, Tabitha. So I really appreciate your organization and uh, this fabulous platform. So um, without further ado, I will go ahead and share my um, screen here. Um, hopefully uh, you guys can let me know if you can see that. And, uh, and I will um, start our um, slideshow here. Give me one second. Can you see that okay? That looks great, Andrew. Great. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk about living with neurodegenerative disease and trying to foster social connection in a time of physical distancing. And you might ask yourself, you know, Tabitha taught you a little bit about my background. I'm a neurologist. I um, love the brain and Parkinson's patients. It's really my passion um, and my pleasure to take care of veterans with Parkinson's on uh, my day job. But I've um, had a little bit of exploration um, in my own personal life with, uh, you know, integrative medicine. I have a yoga teacher background. Uh, I've done some mindfulness training. Um, ended of taking the boards um, after coming to some of the meetings uh, in integrative medicine last year. And uh, so it's really been something that I've been sprinkling into my, my practice and wanted to share, you know, kind of uh, an experience or two um, and, and maybe get a little bit of uh, question and answers going at the end of this. So welcome any of that. So I wanted to talk to you about a patient that's a classic case study for me. John Smith is a 75 year old veteran with a 14 year history of Parkinson's. Uh, Judy has been married to John for 50 years. They have three adult children, two of whom live nearby. 
Judy has enjoyed playing with their four grandchildren ages four through 10 on a weekly basis. Judy has um, helped to clean her home for four hours per week and visits with a friend while John has a physical therapy session once per week for an hour. Once every two weeks, John uh, is left um, with one of the children and Judy goes out to get her nails or her hair done. Um, John has had a decline in his memory for the past three years. He has a tendency to fall once per week. Occasionally, he sees things that aren't there. Additionally, John has had some depression and anxiety for the past five years. He's also had significant apathy. Judy tries to motivate him to exercise or to visit with his fellow vets at the VA. And really, the VA has been a source of um, great community for them. And, um, and so uh, that's been the history historically. Um, he also has some insomnia and some urge to urinate three to four times per night. And since COVID, uh, Judy has not been able to see her grandchildren. They've been um, physically uh, distancing with the you know, restrictions that have been in place. And her adult children um, only come by uh, for a socially distanced meeting with her daughter uh, when she brings groceries once per week. They have not had any physical therapy or exercise classes, and they have not had a chance to visit the VA. They largely watch news of the COVID crisis for many hours at all times of the day and night. John's anxiety and depression have worsened, his insomnia is worse, and he's more confused. John has been napping in the day and is up at all hours of the night. He's been worse with his compliance of his medications. His balance is worse and he has some uh, more near falls at home. Judy is also having some anxiety now and is finding it difficult to sleep at night. She is exhausted. She's been drinking more wine than usual every night. She worries that if something happens to her, there will be no one to take care of John. So this is a pretty classic um, case of mine. And um, I wanna just remind you a little bit about Parkinson's. So Parkinson's is a neurologic disease. It's a neurodegenerative disease um, that we still don't know exactly what causes it. There seems to be a genetic predisposition with environmental interactions. It affects many age groups um, from you know, 30s, 40s, um, for example, Michael J. Fox, uh, all the way 80s, 90s. And we have um, a male predominance, but women also get it. And um, just uh, you know, remembering that it's a motor um, disease where you have stiffness, slowness, and tremor in some patients. Um, there's uh, fall risk, but then there's also this huge amount of non-motor issues that we'll um, touch on through my talk. And so anxiety, depression, apathy, um, things like psychosis can happen. Patients get insomnia, lots of other non-motor issues as well. And so just, you know, want to really kind of tell you about the, the, the sort of complexity of this disease state and why COVID-19 is really affecting our patients and their caregivers in such a dramatic way. So when I talk about apathy, just to remind people, so apathy is a lack of motivation or interest. There's diminished goal or oriented behavior and a dampening of emotional expression. It's different than being lazy or depression. Caregivers often have a sense that the patient doesn't seem to care. They're um, doesn't start or finish things. They're quiet, they're withdrawn, seem bored. They sit alone all day. Um, doing nothing, lack of enthusiasm. Sometimes the patient, the caregiver will say he's like a couch potato. He just sits there all day. And this is common, like 40% of our patients get apathy. So I just wanted to remind you about what that is. So I wanted to tell you about the sort of um, framework of my talk and, and talk about the fact that we're going to be touching on a few things, but sort of um, starting with um, this exciting publication that we had published, um, Lori Mishley, who's a naturopath. And um, one of the things that we've been excited to do is really partner with not just MDs or um, you know classic physicians um, in this classic world of training. I've really enjoyed the wealth of the naturopathic community and other practitioners. As I mentioned, I have a yoga teacher background as well as you know really open-minded to whoever will help our patients. So Lori Mishley is up in Bastyr um, in uh, Seattle. Uh, she has a huge database of patients um, that are answering questionnaires. Um, Josh Farinick helped with this publication as well, who's a, in, a trainee. Um, and we really looked at um, the effects of social isolation on Parkinson's patients and their quality of life. And it just got published and highlighted at one of our national meetings. And I'm just so excited to teach you a little bit about this um, topic today. So the background is that social isolation, as many of you know, is bad for your health. It's a basic human need to need human connection. So it's as human a need as food, shelter, and water. And I think in our society, we've really you know, not paid much attention to this, even going into this pandemic. There was a pandemic of loneliness that had been talked about. And I really urge you to read the work of um, Vivek Murthy, um, who's actually just been uh, nominated. I think he's, he's been appointed to being the Surgeon General of our country. Um, and he has done work and written the book together. And he's just a fabulous sort of um, advocate for uh, social connection 
connection um, in this day and age. So I urge you to read that book. Um, so really, when we think about social connection, um, it's, it's hugely important and an important need. And there's really been a lack of research in Parkinson's. But what we know about social isolation in general is that there's worse health outcomes and increased mortality in general populations. And it's worse uh, to be uh, lonely than um, smoking a half a pack of cigarettes a day or being obese. So really something that we want to care about. And in the VA system, um, this sort of problem affects uh, patients tremendously and can be a risk factor for depression, anxiety, and substance abuse, but also a tremendous risk factor for suicidality. And so just we started looking at this pre-COVID um, in a large database because we were thinking that this really could affect our patients. So to define a couple of uh, the definitions here, so social isolation itself is the lack of integration of individuals in their social environment. Living alone, possessing fewer social network ties and minimal social contacts are markers of social isolation. So those are things that you can measure, but then loneliness is sort of this subjective emotional state in which there's a perception of being socially isolated. And so there's this felt feeling of being lonely. And it's really this gap between what people desire as a social relationship and what they have. And so they really desire something richer in their social relationships and they feel that they don't, their, their um, real relationships don't meet this. And there's this gap that's felt. So loneliness is actually quite complex. I, I didn't really realize this until I started digging into this for the study, but there's actually three spheres of loneliness. And so when we think about somebody in a partnered relationship, let's say they come to you and they're look happily married, they're sitting with their spouse there. Um, it really is something that is not just needing um, a partner or, or to, to be intimately connected through loneliness, but there's actually two other spheres. Um, so there's really three spheres in which you need to have um, human connection. One is this intimate or emotional sphere in which you have a, lone, a yearning for a close confidant or an emotional partner. The second is this relational or uh, social loneliness in which you have a longing for close friendships and social companionship. And the third is this collective loneliness in which you need um, a, a network or a community of people who share one sense of purpose and interest. And really for some of our veterans that might be belonging to the VA and for some of our Parkinson's patients, it may be belonging to a Parkinson's support group. So it is really quite complex. And so when we're addressing a patient, it's really important to think, are they meeting these three spheres of um, connection? So in general, just a background on loneliness and how it affects the body. Stress um, can affect uh, the body, as you know, and social support actually buffers the effects of stress. Loneliness can improve, um, uh, loneliness worsens your immune system. It can affect your cognition. So if you're lonely, you become hypervigilant. Um, and so lonely people, when you test them in uh, ways uh, that we have that are standardized, they often fixate more on visually, um, socially threatening um, stimuli uh, in, in certain things. And it, it actually can also disrupt your circadian rhythm. So as you can imagine, if you have uh, lonely individuals in uh, the world, Today, due to COVID, they're, they're being uh, physically distanced and they're listening to CNN or news reports and they start to get um, fixated on um, certain types of negative stimuli, become hypervigilant. This can really affect the, their mental state quite tremendously, affect their sleep processes. And in the context of being um, you know, well uh, suited, it, let's say if you got infected with COVID, it can really be a risk factor for worsening possibly your ability to fight the infection. So, so the things to con consider just in the general general population that you may all be dealing with. Um, but in my Parkinson's population, we care about um, the effects of loneliness because even going into the pandemic, we were worried that our patients were more socially withdrawn. So there was a sense that because of the immobility of our patients, some of them have soft voice, some of them have possibly um, things that are embarrassing like drooling, um, things like dyskinesia, which are the extra Michael J. Fox type movements, tremor. These things may have affected patients going out and about in communities in general. There's that host of non-motor issues I talked about about, including things like apathy. And then there's this perceived stigma of just having Parkinson's in some patients that they feel that they may not fit in, in in the general community. So we were already concerned going into the COVID pandemic about this um, concern of social withdrawal. And then here we are now in the middle of the pandemic. And so our findings are all the more interesting, I feel. 
So we had um, 2,100 patients that were doing a survey. 1,746 were found to have idiopathic Parkinson's. We followed them over time with a web-based questionnaire. Um, we looked at a number of things that were modifiable risk factors, um, things like exercise, the foods they ate, um, how connected they were in their communities and ask them a number of questions um, to answer these. And so with respect to the loneliness things, um, we asked them two questions um, on the promise questionnaires, as well as um, two questions, which were true false uh, statements. One of which was, I am lonely, true or false, or I have a lot of friends. And the results were quite striking. So here we see um, the effects of tremor on quality of life. And when you think about a Parkinson's patient, often people think tremor must affect their quality of life. Well, actually it really doesn't seem to affect quality of life that much. And when we think about the things that do affect quality of life, I want you to focus on this red line here. You see that loneliness is actually quite, um, quite uh, problematic for quality of life. So people who are lonely had much poorer quality of life and having a lot of friends seemed to um, bode well for quality of life. So this was quite a striking finding to us. And we looked at a number of things as Parkinson's doc, we spend a lot of time counseling on exercise and its benefits in terms of um, quality of life in Parkinson's. And here we see the beneficial effects of exercising seven days a week, 30 minutes a day here. And we see that it's as bad for you to be lonely um, as, or even worse for you to be lonely as the beneficial effects of, or the good effects of exercising seven days a week, 30 minutes a day. And so you can imagine if you have um, the double whammy of being, you know, lonely and isolated and, and not exercising stuck, let's say on your couch, really in this sort of apathetic framework, this is you know, doubly bad for your Parkinson's outcomes. But looking at the positive um, flip, if you think about, you know, trying to motivate patients to get out, maybe in the pre-COVID era, connect in a group class, like a yoga class, perhaps seven days a week of exercise, there's boxing classes for Parkinson's, all kinds of things out there that we have um, that affect um, the ability to exercise as well as socially connect. It's quite exciting as to the possible beneficial effects of the synergy of these two um, things that patients can do for themselves. So I mentioned that Parkinson's is not just a, a motor disease. Um, it also is a huge non-motor um, aspects. And there's things like the autonomic nervous system that are affected, the psychological systems, there's um, various issues in cognition. And so we looked in this, um, what I like to call the maple leaf diagram at things which are affected by loneliness. And you can see here that this line here is, um, uh, the lonely group and then the filled in part is the um, not lonely group and you see that um, you know motor symptoms are affected also by loneliness, but it really seems to affect the non motor systems and we can't really tell what's the cause what's the effect but these two things live together so to being lonely really can be detrimental and live with these negative non motor issues in Parkinson's things like um, uh, depression, anxiety, apathy, cognition, all of these things seem to be not good in lonely patients. So coming to sort of this um, current COVID-19 pandemic, we're really talking about this synergy of three pandemics happening um, simultaneously. And it's quite concerning to us. And we've been trying to draw this attention to our uh, physicians and other healthcare providers that are taking care of patients with Parkinson's. Number one, there's an increase in Parkinson's disease globally. And just so folks know, Parkinson's disease, the numbers of cases of Parkinson's have doubled in the last 40 years and they're estimated to double again in the next 20 years. So we need a lot of people that care about Parkinson's and no matter what sphere of practice you're in, I think you'll be seeing patients with Parkinson's. So important for you to know these. Um, and then there's this loneliness pandemic even coming into the COVID-19 um, framework. We were already worried about the negative effects about loneliness. And then we add this COVID-19 pandemic on top of it. So, you know, really three things that are synergistically working together that could affect our patients. And we, very very early on in, um, in the pandemic had this cartoon that was um, put out to our groups of physicians that are taking care of Parkinson's in a good publication, talking about the concern of this downward spiral, the burden of COVID-19 for people with Parkinson's. So social isolation was hugely um, already of a concern um, in this publication. This was before our data even came out, even though there wasn't actual data um, to support this, there was a, a general thought that we were worried about social isolation, stress, and physical physical inactivity affecting our Parkinson's patients, possibly causing a downward spiral of worsening symptoms, worsening cognitive issues. How can we um, 
uh, help with this downward spiral and break the cycle where we're talking about many of the things that many of us spend a lot of time counseling about in the integrative medicine universe. So things like mindfulness, um, exercise, uh, social connection. So I just wanted to point out that even in our own publications in the neurology world, um, we are mindful and, and the winners of the day have been posited as the types of things that we talk about at our meetings here at the Integrative Medicine Society, so uh, the AIHM. So I think it's really exciting. So anyway, so in our paper, we actually put this figure in talking about, you know, this downward spiral as well. We talked about the social isolation aspect affecting various parts of the stress hormones, affecting immunity, affecting sleep, this uh, then affecting motor symptoms and non-motor issues as well, leading to further withdrawal of patients from their um, social connections. And really this concern that we could really have a spiraling effect that was out of control. And really sort of the um, thing that we talked about to break that cycle is this concept of social prescribing that I wanna teach you a little bit about. So we've really sort of thought about a framework and you might wonder why does a Parkinson's doc care about social connection or loneliness in the first place? You should be, you know, pushing the medications and the surgeries on these patients. Well, I think that what hopefully my data has shown you is that this is a really huge impact for Parkinson's patients and is a truly modifiable risk factor. But this concept of social prescribing, I think is something that's exciting for us all. And I really wanted to teach you about that today, not just in my neurodegenerative patients, but for every one of us living through this pandemic. So we want to be thinking about being proactive and asking people how they're doing and finding out about these three spheres of connection. So asking, do you have support in, you know, someone at home, some friends, some people, if you feel connected in the community, ask about those questions proactively. Patients are not going to come in and tell you that they're lonely, especially my vets who are male. They're often stoic. They're really not going to complain about this. They're really important. Then we want to try to think about ways that we can um, socially prescribe. And what social pres prescribing is, is this new term literally of taking a patient and prescribing them an intervention of social support. So trying to connect them to something that could socially support them. And it might be a yoga group. It might be a mindfulness group. It might be a church group. So you have to think about through an interview with the patient, what that might be. And perhaps it's just a neighbor who can call on them once a week. Maybe in a Parkinson's support group, you might have somebody who can call on the patient from the support group once a week to check in on them. So I think we just really wanna be thinking about these um, ways to support patients and proactively you know, help them. So bringing sort of some of the integrative medicine principles, because I want to teach you a little bit about some a few things in the Parkinson's world outside of social prescribing that may help our patient population. So I don't need to tell you guys about integrative medicine and how amazing it is, but I really think about this, um, you know, the World Health Organization's definition of health um, as something that I keep in my mind every day, that it's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And so thinking about this holistic sort of approach where we're thinking about, you know, supporting patients um, in this uh, way is helpful. And with our patients and many patients, I think out there, they're really asking for things like, you know, wanting to decrease pill burdens, wanting guidance over what the wellness strategies might be for them um, that are actually, you know, beneficial, wanting a sense of, um, you know, what is hope versus hype in social media. A lot of them get a barrage of information and want help to understand how to navigate that. They want help communicating with their healthcare providers about their interests in integrative medicine. And they want a roadmap of, you know, Know, where they can insert these things. Is it, you know, at the diagnosis? Is it later? And they also want help sort of in the broader framework of advocacy and health. Think somebody who thinks a little bit more about their quality of life and not just about, um, you know, sort of just the, uh, the pills and things like that. So really thinking about, you know, a more holistic approach to um, advocacy for them, their quality of life and, and where, who they are in the world. So I think, you know, those are things that we can really provide as people who are cross-trained, maybe with some of the integrative medicine principles. So when I give these talks, I, I do talk to patients about um, these treatments. And I really try to caution them a little bit. And I wanted to just tell you a little bit about what kinds of things I say as a Western trained Parkinson's doc who knows about what's out there. So I tell them to be aware of things that are cures and miracles. I tell them to be careful about things that are only available outside of the US or Europe, things that are very expensive or profit driven infomercials that they're only seeing on social media. Um, and to be careful about any approach that's going to tell them to stop their conventional treatments and to, you know, not partner with um, somebody like me, you know, so I, I tell them to be aware of these things. 
We also have to be aware in some of our patients about the approach to using things with the sense that they are completely benign. So I think it's important for patients to realize that even though um, you might be on a supplement or herb, it may interact with some of the Parkinson's medicines. So for example, St. John's wort is an example of that, um, that some of them, the, these supplements and herbs can be processed through the same organ systems that process the medicines that we give them. Sometimes too much of certain types of things like B6, for example, can cause neurological issues if taken in excess. Um, important for them to know that some of the side effects of herbs, um, even for example, cannabis in some situations may impair their ability to drive or stay awake in some settings. So it's important to tell their providers about what they're thinking of using and get um, some advice um, about that. Additionally, I think it's important for our patients. A lot of them think about, you know, Ayurvedic systems, for example, there's been a lot of talk about something like turmeric or macuna and um, using these um, sort of therapies um, to help the patients um, with a sense that, you know, we're just taking a powder and putting it in a pill and giving it to the patient. I truly believe that turmeric can be beneficial in neurodegenerative disease, but I think it's more of the way that it's given in diet um, cooked in fat in a certain way with a more holistic diet plan. So not just taking um, the supplement by itself. So, you know, I think these approaches are important to understand. Um, there has been in some countries, the use of Mucuna for um, Parkinson's patients, and it is a source of dopamine. The types of things that people need to understand is that it's not formulated with another agent that has um, a way to metabolize the dopamine better. With, so, and when we give dopamine um, medications to Parkinson's patients, it's formulated along with carbidopa. So it's important for patients to understand the differences between some of these delivery mechanisms. And then, you know, the fact that the FDA doesn't necessarily regulate some of these um, things. So it's important for them to understand that the formulation of the products is also quite important. So just touching on some areas that have been studied in Parkinson's. So one is the, um, the fact that acupuncture has been studied a little bit in Parkinson's and many of the studies in Parkinson's disease have shown that um, in acupuncture that we don't have any great defined things that seem to work well. One of the things that have been um, touted in acupuncture is that even the sham sites seem to work. And so my sense is that there's probably a placebo effect in the sham sites. And I think overall, there may be a beneficial effect of seeing practitioners that do acupuncture. We just haven't really sorted that out yet. Other things that have been studied a little bit in our world. Um, so things like yoga have been studied. And I think recently there's been some better studies that have come out. So I wanted to point you in this direction of this study that was published in JAMA Neurology with some mindful yoga versus stretching and resistance training exercises. And I think this was a good study looking at non-motor issues, anxiety, depression. These are the sorts of areas that I think can be very helped with these sorts of mind-body approaches in our patient population. And Tai Chi as well has been quite well studied. And I think it is reasonable to get patients with Parkinson's to do Tai Chi as well. I think there's reasonable studies um, in this area as well. And I think there's lots of research to be done. So I'm um, so excited to see what the future holds. And I continue to be excited and a huge proponent of looking at the interface between um, neurology and uh, integrative medicine for the approach to many of these patient types. So I think the bottom line is to keep an open communication and collaboration between our um, different types of subspecialties. So I'm a Parkinson's neurologist. I work very closely with somebody like Lori Mishley, a naturopath. We share ideas. Um, if there are other um, practitioners involved in the care of my patients, I like to know what's happening. So I think it is, you know, helpful to keep the communication lines um, open. So with respect to that, um, you know, having um, a patients bring in lists of supplements and herbs uh, to all the practitioners, including their medications on there as well, so that everyone's on the same page, informing all the healthcare providers of all the approaches that are being um, uh, uh, adopted by the patient, including the physician, um, conventional trained physicians, and weighing in on risks and benefits of integrative medicine therapies. Um, if there is something new that's started, for example, if I have a patient that just recently starts some sort of approach like acupuncture, I try not to change anything else in the background so that we can establish what the beneficial or negative effects of that therapy is, just as if it was a new pill that I was adding. And then the final thing is that um, I still believe that in conventional therapy, so for example, levodopa replacement therapy in Parkinson's has a major role. And we have a lot of data to support that um, things like Cinemet in a Parkinson's brain is 
is helpful to keep the patients exercising, keep them active. And so I really am of the mindset that we are not trying to stop conventional therapies um, as integrative medicine providers, that we're really trying to use the therapies that work in Western medicine for the symptoms, especially the motor symptoms that work well for that. And then thinking about that whole host of non-motor issues that I talked about. And that's really where I think the money is for some of these integrative approaches. And the VA has been kind of awesome at thinking about the more holistic approaches as well. And, and so I run a center of excellence at the VA. I wanted to point out that the VA has this new, newish um, whole health model where we have the, the patient in the middle and then a number of other um, sorts of things, um, including you know, nutrition, sleep, um, all these little uh, circles here around. And then thinking about the patient, not just in their um, in isolation, but really thinking about these other um, complementary approaches here, as well as the community at large. And that's where we talk about these sort of social determinants of health, which I, I feel are quite important. So the types of things that I teach my patients when I'm approaching them is to find, uh, you know, what, what is the secret sauce that helps our patients thrive? I'll just kind of run through that for a few minutes just so you know a little bit about my prescription for success in Parkinson's. So the first thing is um, figuring out your purpose. So we want to get a sense of the purpose, defining the goal of care. What is their purpose in life? What is their priority for getting healthy? What brings them joy and what supports their well-being? So I think it's important for all of us actually to know a little bit about this, think about this um, in our approach to life, trying to stay mentally active. Um, and I think that, you know, in the pandemic, I've encouraged patients to try to think about bite-sized goals. So maybe reading um, a short story or um, a, a small, um, you know, article might be something. I think, you know, the folks that are reading War and Peace, uh, that, that may be something that's, you know, helpful for some folks, but I think biting off too big of a chunk of something to do sometimes can be overwhelming and patients don't even know where to start. So I think, you know, these small bite-sized chunks, learning, an, you know, an, an instrument, maybe thinking about, you know, language that you always want to learn, um, reconnecting with some of these things can be very helpful, I think, to keep our patients um, mentally active. Exercise is medicine in Parkinson's. I think there's lots of research to support the benefits of exercise, not just for motor symptoms, but even in non-motor realms too. And in Parkinson's, I showed you a couple of studies. And so just to um, uh, sort of uh, flesh it out a little bit, so really want to get some skill-based approaches, aerobic exercise, resistance training, balance, um, mind-body approaches, and then stretching and flexibility. And I think if you look at these things, um, you know, I think that yoga fits a number of those. We can get, um, you know, a lot of these sort of boxes ticked with something like yoga, um, balance box, the mind-body box, stretching flexibility. There's some resistance approaches that you can take, aerobic approaches that you can take, and certainly um, skill-based, you can modify it with goal-oriented goal movements um, in which timing and space and accuracy is important. And you can kind of keep making it more and more complex to challenge the brain. So I think, you know, I've been a big proponent of yoga and Parkinson's and have worked, been working on a yoga program to teach yoga teachers about working with our patients. So stay tuned for that. But, you know, as you can see, there's lots of other types of exercise. And I think, you know, for approaching the patient, you want to just find out what they enjoy doing and try to get some them to do something every day if possible. Sleep is hugely key in any neurodegenerative disease. I think many of you know this already. If we can aim for eight hours a night, um, I think in the pandemic, I've been um, you know, talking to patients about trying to really nail down um, a schedule every day, trying to set a bedtime and awake time, try to keep active in the middle so that we're not napping in the day. So trying to write out our goals. And if it means you know, five minutes of exercise every hour, even instead of if they can't keep sustain 30 minutes or an hour of exercise, then that's fine, but write it down and try to stick to these goals. Um, and then, uh, winding down before bedtime is tremendously helpful. So trying to prevent, you know, too much blue light, too much, um, you know, stimulation of the brain. So really trying to read a, a quiet, um, book somewhere, listen to quiet music, um, disconnecting from social media for, if you can, two hours before bedtime is really helpful. And the more you exercise, the better you can sleep. So really, really key. And in our populations, we do use melatonin for sleep because it can actually help with some extra movements that some of our patients get during sleep. And also want to put out a shout out to the coexistence in many po aging populations of sleep apnea. And so um, really taking that history and treating sleep apnea aggressively if patients have it can really be helpful for restorative sleep and actually for motor and non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's as well. 
So nutrition, it's uh, pretty standard. I think a lot of this uh, chat, but I think we recommend the Mediterranean diet, lots of colorful fresh fruits and vegetables. A lot of our patients get constipated. So if you can give them good fiber, prunes, things like that can be very helpful. Another thing to know about Parkinson's patients is that it affects their sense of smell. So a lot of our patients lose their taste function. And so adding extra spices and herbs and um, things like that is actually very helpful in our patient populations as well. Hydration is key. Um, the autonomic nervous system gets affected in Parkinson's disease. So um, drinking lots of fluids, um, six to eight glasses of fluid a day. Um, and uh, largely uh, we try to get, get them to drink free water, things sometimes salty, well, salty drinks like V8, coconut water, Gatorade can be helpful to keep um, blood pressure up. In our patient population, a lot of patients have low blood pressure and they actually feel quite faint when they stand up. And if they don't drink enough fluids, they can, um, that can really exacerbate their um, low blood pressure problems and affect their thinking and motor function too. So, so these are some helpful tips in, in our populations and it may be different in other populations, but certainly I think hydration is not stressed enough in, in general with patients. The gut gets affected in our patient population. And so there has been a question whether patients should take a probiotic. And I think the jury's still out on that, but I think prebiotics are very reasonable in our population. Sometimes people have talked about supplements in our population. To be honest, there hasn't been a lot of data to support supplements, but you know, um, I think uh, a lot of us would say um, that it's uh, melatonin is reasonable, curcumin is reasonable, especially um, when added in diet. Um, CoQ10 is reasonable at um, certain doses. Vitamin D is definitely something that we do try to replace and correct at least to the level of 40 if possible. Um, so these are all, and then getting some um, omega-3 type uh, uh, as well, uh, supplementation um, is, a, is definitely helpful as well in our patient population. But I, I think that there's no clear data to say in a Parkinson's population that these are absolutely necessary. Um, we often do check screening labs once a year, especially because our patients are often on the older side and um, are predisposed due to the Parkinson's to get cognitive issues. And so we tend to check these sorts of labs and do a bone scan about once a year. So vitamin B12, D, thyroid panel, uh, lipid panel, hemoglobin A1C are all things that we check about once a year. Coming to the mind-body approaches, I don't need to tell the, this audience too much about the benefits of that, but I really do believe that if we can get our patients meditating for 20 minutes a day, um, I've given a lot of talks to patients um, over the, this pandemic about gratitude practices, journaling, using breathing to help anxiety. These are all hugely, I think, beneficial. We've, we've been talking a lot to our patients about getting out in nature, taking walks in nature and gardening, things like that. Definitely helpful, I think, in these populations. And then anything that you enjoy. So singing, dancing, music, art, all, all good things. Um, and if, if you um, feel comfort in prayer, you know, we, we definitely encourage that as well. So you know, all of the things that you guys are talking about, we try to instill in our patients as well. Coming to the social connection, I've already given you data on this. So I, I do try to encourage patients even early in diagnosis to figure out who's their tribe, who's their cheerleader and confidant, um, try to connect with their neighbors, um, find a support group. Currently we're doing most of our things online, exercise classes online, religious class, uh, groups online, if they w would like to continue that, um, you know, finding time on a Zoom connection uh, through uh, to family uh, to keep safe, but continue to keep connected. And uh, I know that my parents have been doing a little bit of this with my nieces and nephews doing a reading to their um, grandchildren over Zoom as a way to connect as well. And so we've been doing a lot of this myself and my family and hopefully people are finding ways to connect. So, so just wanted to tell you a little bit of a couple of things that I've been doing. So on day one of the pandemic, I uh, called up a local support group organization that does great um, virtual support group meetings. And we started doing some videos. Um, once a week, we do a virtual support group um, and we have now, I think, hundreds of patients from all over the world that are joining on these. And then um, we archive the videos to um, YouTube. And uh, it's been kind of a nice repository of um, a lot of wealth of knowledge and information. And, and so um, it's, I think this has been kind of really a nice thing for our patients. And some of our patients have actually felt like this is the one social thing they do 
a week is to join my, you know, virtual support group meeting, believe it or not. So, so these things can make a difference. So, you know, consider the disease states that you're passionate about and maybe starting this. It's been really a labor of love, but really something that's been really fun for me and, and really great. And we've, you know, lots of archived, um, videos here. I think we've had about 70 something interviews at this point with all kinds of folks. So dance with Parkinson's, you know, mindfulness teachers, yoga teachers, um, all, and, you know, all kinds of folks. I've also been um, transforming some of those uh, speakers into a blog on Parkinson's. Um, and so it's been kind of fun to think about ways to kind of connect with the community um, that uh, is out there, but um, is, is really kind of dealing with a lot of um, issues these days. And so I just wanted to, um, in the last couple of minutes, plug a few things. So one is um, self-care for all. And when we think about all, I told you about that story of the patient and his uh, spouse. And I think, you know, with Parkinson's, you're certainly dealing with not just the patient that's in front of you, but everyone who touches that patient and the caregivers are so key. So I spend a lot of time telling my caregivers about these same principles. So um, the sense that they they need to take care of themselves with that oxygen mask analogy, put that on if you're going to take care of anyone else, um, finding ways to support the caregiver for them to be able to, um, you know, seek help if they're feeling distraught, um, finding ways for the caregiver to get sleep, exercise, and uh, eat, eating right, things like that for them. And I think it doesn't hurt to think about us as caregivers as well, our healthcare provider communities. And so I really think that, you know, many of us, um, I think you saw my my son here walking in the background are, are trying to, um, you know, keep the dream alive at home with our children in school and, um, you know, trying to balance jobs and um, our own families, my parents are aging, they're in a uh, they're in Canada, I haven't seen them in a year, you know, trying to deal with all of these different things um, are, is hard. And any one of these jobs in and of themselves would be, you know, quite a job, a full-time job in and of themselves. So I think expecting to be perfect at all of this is really impossible. And so we just have to kind of accept that we're good enough sometimes. And I've really taken um, some um, tips from others and not comparing myself to other people. I had friends in this pandemic who've painted their house, um, you know, published a book, uh, done, you know, published eight articles a month, all kinds of great things not happening in my household, unfortunately. Um, you know, I'm really trying to self pace, realizing that this is a sprint. Um, uh, is a marathon and not just a sprint. And so we're, we really have to, you know, think about, um, you know, ourselves and self-care I think is huge. So, um, you know, just trying to stay um, uh, well, uh, sort of cared for myself, um, trying to sleep in sometimes, trying to take a break, get some alone time, just away from just all the things and all the people that are, you know, really, um, you know, we're supporting on a day-to-day -day um, sort of uh, level. So I, I do hope this for each of you out there as well. And hopefully we can, you know, each take our, uh, a, a moment to think about ourselves and, and what we can give, uh, to ourselves as well. So at the beginning of this pandemic, I, um, had reached out to a colleague who's a psychology, um, psychologist and a, and a cartoonist. And, um, we had, uh, taught about sort of all the emotions that we ourselves and other healthcare providers in the universe were going through. And we put together this um, emotions and she drew it out and we put this up on Facebook and it actually seemed to resonate a lot and was shared like, I think like 80,000 times or something like that. It was really, you know, resonating with a lot of folks just to sort of identify the individual um, sorts of emotions that we were all dealing with. And I think, you know, now eight, nine months into this pandemic, we still are each having an array of each of these emotions every day. I know I do. There's still a sense of foreboding and fear, frustration, grief. But at the same time, there's a mix of, you know, things that are hope and, you know, solidarity. I feel like I've been more connected to some of my team in this time frame than I ever have been. So I think it's it's helpful to look at that um, sort of framework. And, and I think we're sort of at a crossroads a little bit with um, you know, what we're doing right now in, in the world. And I know I've been spending a lot more time thinking about my community, my approach to my patients, trying to advocate for certain ones. And I just wanted to put a plug in to certain sorts of um, things that I've sort of been focusing on. One is when we think about a Parkinson's patient, a lot of the studies that have been done have largely been in, um, men who are in their late 60s who are married, affluent, and white. That is just the way that the studies are done and that's who gets the best care. And I've really been spending some time thinking about underserved groups. And so we've been spending time thinking about women 
as um, not only caregivers, but even as our patients and the sort of different types of things that they're dealing with. So a lot of them have guilt. They're dealing with multiple generations to care for. They themselves are overscheduled. They have unique issues in terms of who's caring for them and who they um, find as advocates for them. Um, many of them are um, having issues with, uh, you know, not being able to communicate well about their needs to providers and their caregivers. And so we really have to think about this. Um, and I, I want, I urge you to think when you're approaching um, your patients, and I know many of you do, and I've learned a lot about this, even in the meetings that I've come to with this organization about, you know, how each person in front of us is their own individual and what their own barriers to getting good care and, and um, being able to um, reap the rewards of, of that good care um, can be. And in our patients with Parkinson's, certainly uh, women, African women especially are really underserved. And I've been spending a little bit of time thinking about this. So um, just my final couple of slides here. I feel like, you know, we are really at a crossroads and I think going into the holiday season, I'm the last talk before the holidays and it's an exciting talk to be giving. Um, really thinking about, you know, reflecting a little bit on the time that we're in and what the silver linings of this time frame could be. So I really felt like I've had a moment to pause and reflect, to be more present in my space, in my home, and, uh, you know, in my world and, and understand kind of what's happening, um, what I've taken for granted, um, sort of how connected we all are in the world. Um, it's a, a virus that starts you know, across the globe can affect my family here. My sense of, you know, wearing a mask, you know, can affect, you know, how I am keeping other people around me safe. I've really had a new respect for our planet, um, really a, a new respect for the people that I may not have um, really thought about as closely. So that, you know, people like teachers and grocery store workers, postal people who bring me my packages of things I'm ordering, you know, all these things that are kind of helping to keep us all, you know, alive and connected. I think in healthcare, I, there's some silver linings that I've felt, um, and these include things like uh, we've really had an opportunity to shine a light on the social inequalities of what, of our systemic um, healthcare system here, and uh, issues that you know are uh, race specific, um, gender specific, you know, socioeconomic uh, specific. I, I've really been trying to understand these a little bit more as I've been doing these support groups and really trying to help. Um, each and every one of our patients out there with Parkinson's, but I think we can think about this um, for all of um, every, every patient that we serve out there. I think it's given us an opportunity to break down um, the barriers for telehealth and get the care out to some people who are in need. But if you don't have a, a, a connection with the internet, that's good. If you don't have the money to afford a computer, then you're kind of out of that loop. And so I do have concerns about some of the ways that we're um, giving care. And I think we, these things need to be addressed um, in the future. Um, I think that we've broken down some of the silos and some of the barriers with um, really working as a team. And I know that, you know, on some of, I've been more connected these days with my team, given this pandemic than I ever have felt before. And uh, I think it's given new meaning. I showed you that slide and who the winners of the day are and really the things that even hardcore scientists who deal with Parkinson's patients and uh, their research are talking about how the integrative medicine models, um, things like mindfulness, things like exercise, things like social connection can really make a difference for how our patients and their caregivers are doing. And so I think the work that we do um, with the AIHM and this organization and every day with our patients is really honestly meaningful to me and I think to patients and people, the world is realizing that. So I'm excited for the future from that perspective. I also have been spending a little bit of time in the advanced care planning um, sort of thoughts as well. And I think another thing that is important, I think is the sort of sense of, um, uh, palliative care providers and thinking about end of life issues in a, in a way that we may maybe never have before, given the opportunity that COVID is a time that we can discuss this. And so I wrote a paper recently with a colleague about, um, you know, hoping for the best and planning for the worst and really thinking about the COVID-19 pandemic as a framework to talk about, you know, what people would want should they get sick, what people would want if their, um, you know, caregiver got sick, things like that. And so, you know, I think these are some you know, opportunities um, that I, you know, think is, is a time frame that we can all reflect on things that may not have been what we were focusing on before the pandemic. So um, thank you so much. And I just want to say namaste to you all out there and uh, happy to take any questions.
And I will stop sharing. So Dr. Indu, that was just phenomenal. I have to say, I feel so inspired by you and um, just really the work that you're doing and and really the message. And I will say that, you know, from one of the things that COVID really has, has given us is that opening, that opening to ask the question of like, how could we do better? And how could we recreate? How could we actually recreate? And, and um, what possibilities do we have? And to see how truly connected people can be, even on a Zoom, right? Like who would have really thought that before this, in this way, and what, that, what this has meant for so many people, um, it's really exciting. And it's, I think we're at a time in the world that is really about possibilities. And I really appreciated you also, you know, speaking to the need for um, our research to really become more diverse and to focus on um, you know, the, the fact that there is not, there are not studies done on a diverse population uh, for so many diseases. Parkinson is just one of those. Um, you know, this earlier the, this year, we at the Academy really made a commitment um, to make this issue important to us as a community and to really start thinking about how could we bring the challenges we have faced around structural racism and that have influenced the integrative community into our um, consciousness. And, you know, for those of you who are interested, uh, we have a Black, Indigenous, and People of Color Task Force that is just really doing incredible work. They helped us transform our conference and they have opened up um, the, the membership to have more people join that. So if that is important to you, uh, please consider uh, doing that. And um, I also just wanted to, um, you know, take a minute to really thank you, Indu, for um, the work that you're doing to connect Parkinson's patients. I mean, the blog and the, the YouTube channel, I posted it out to the community. What a phenomenal gift. Um, so congratulations on that. Thanks. It's been fun, actually. I've been learning a lot. And it's, I mean, I think it goes both ways, right? A lot of us have um, take so much um, of our purpose and our happiness from seeing our patients and hugging them and seeing, you know, being, being with them, right? I mean, that's sort of why we go into medicine. And um, I mean, I think that I was going through withdrawal and I was kind of freaking out. I'm like, I'm not gonna be able to see my patients. How am I going to connect with them? And so, but literally it, it has been, a little interesting to see that literally some of these patients are saying that it's the only social connection that they've had all week. And that, you know, if I don't do it, one week, I'm like, where are you? What's going on? I'm like, I, we have to take a break, you know, I'm on vacation this week or, you know, something like that. But it's, it's kind of a, a cool thing. It's a great sense of community. And I think patients have really taken this time to advocate and be activists themselves, which I, I love, um, you know, being part of that you know, journey with them and seeing like where they feel, um, you know, and it's really a global connection that they've, you know, they're, they've taken this um, task of, you know, trying to get medication to basic thing, basic medicine to places in Africa that may not even be able to get, you know, um, basic things, you know, so I think they've, they've sort of taken that activism and purpose and reframed it, which I'm, I'm really proud of, you know, that. And I think, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity and, uh, and I do think that, you know, when I give these talks, I, I've been thinking about just not just the patients, right. But all of us too, as healthcare providers, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, changes that we're all facing and we have to kind of be honest about how much of a toll it's taking on, on us as well, you know, not being able to be in community with each other, you know, at, or um, with our patients and our teams, you know, in, in person. So it's been kind of a loss. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I love too how you um, just pointed out that having time for your family, not doing a million projects, like is actually a great solution, you know, just really um, gifting that connection instead of filling it up with a whole bunch of stuff that you're going to do because you're, you know, social or isolating right now. And, and, and um, I, I just love that. I also think that is a big gift right now that we are getting and, and is 
thinking about how do we want to spend our time on this planet? You know, together, how can we make those moments more meaningful um, and not just fill it up with all the things that, you know, we have to do. So yeah, really beautiful. Really yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. So we do have some questions. Um, I there we can take a couple questions and one in here um, is about differentiating can Parkinson patients be di differentiated by their genetic codes have you seen any um, research or um, around genetics yeah so there is some genetic um, predispositions there's definitely some genes that predispose people to getting Parkinson's and some families in which you know there is you know many many members of the family seem to have it. In general, Parkinson's is not a terribly inherited disease. So in the general population, let's say if you had one parent with Parkinson's, what would be the risk of you getting it is not very high. It's, you know, um, it's like, I think 2% or something like that. It's, it's really not very much. So I think it is what, you know, it, it's like puts you at, it's a, I think about 1% of the population gets Parkinson's, you know, if you live long enough. And then if you had a genetic predisposition, it's like, you know, puts you at a slightly, you know, I think it's like 3% or something like that. So it's not usually genetic, but it is one of those things where um, there is genetic predispositions and they're trying to study those. And in, in those sorts of populations, there may be targeted therapies, but it's not like we run sequences of things. And even when I know that a patient has a genetic predisposition, sometimes that patient, you know, um, can still manifest, you know, in a very different way than their family member. And then some people who carry a gene may never manifest at all. So it's not like one of those things where we have a, a really great cookie cutter sense of, um, you know, how that's going to pan out. Well, we are um, almost out of time here, so I'm not going to be able to take any other questions, but I just really um, wanted to thank you again. This was one of our most attended events on Facebook and just got great interaction there as well. And even Dr. Lori Mishley was watching us live there. So oh, really? <laughs> shout out to her. Hi, Lori, we miss you. <laughs> and um, so, you know, this is our last webinar of the year. We are going to resume our webinars in January. And I just want to thank, take a minute to thank all of you that have participated and um, been a part of these webinars this year. All of our speakers just volunteer their time and uh, we've really grown a, a community out there and we're just so thankful um, for all of you. And so I, I really encourage you to let us know. We're going to be sending out a survey to everyone who's participated in webinars to let us know what you'd like to see next year. Um, if you have a speaker or a topic that you'd like to see, um, you know, let us know about that and um, have a really wonderful and safe holiday. And um, we will see you in 2021. Again, uh, Dr. Indu Subramanian, thank you so much. Thank you. Namaste and happy holidays and stay safe, everyone. <laughs>